I'm Guy O'Lakin. Um, I'm going to start today by just, I guess, spend half the time or maybe a little over half just going through the structure of the class, going through the syllabus, the kind of stuff that you need. Um, and uh, then I think we'll have time after that's over to get started a little bit on kind of what thermodynamics is. Um, we won't get into like equations or anything, I don't think, yet today. Um, so first of all, for the syllabus, uh, I assume everyone here has been on D2L before. Maybe there's people who transferred from other community colleges or something that haven't. But um, the syllabus is on D2L. <clears throat> so if you go to the Normandale main page, and up at the top right, there's a D2L um, link. Sign in with your star ID. If any of this, you don't know how to do any of this, come talk to me and I can point you towards IT or whatever. Um, but this is important because everything for this whole class is going to be on D2L. So, um, But once you get into D2L, uh, you have a list of all the classes you're taking. Probably looks something like this. I don't know. It's reformatted a little bit. But this is these are the classes, the two classes I teach and then one that I'm sort of associated with. Um, and we we want thermodynamics. And when you click on that, you get to the main thermodynamics page. Um, the first thing that comes up when you get into the thermodynamics main page are these announcements. <clears throat> and the one that's up there right now doesn't tell you much that's important. But um, as I put new materials up, uh, when I assign problems, uh, when there's tests coming up and stuff, anything I want you to know or anything new that I've put up, uh, I'm going to um, put an announcement up that says something new happened. So uh, you should just get in the habit of going to D2L, like maybe, why not every day? It only takes a couple seconds. Um, see if there's anything new on the announcements, you know. And if it doesn't say anything new there, then you don't have to worry about it. Um, as far as new materials that I put up, uh, that's going to be under materials, content, and um, right now, let's see what we have. Uh, so what we need right now is under course information, there's the syllabus that we're going to go through. Um, there's some information about campus support services. There are great campus support services at Normandale. Um, if you click on this, it just tells you about uh, how to, you know, where the tutoring center is, the library, the testing center hours, you know, the library hours, all that kind of stuff, um, printing stuff out. Disability services, um, we have a great uh, office of of, it's called the Office for Students with Disabilities. Um, and uh, in engineering classes, you know, it, it largely has been um, useful to people who, uh, you know, have been or have been diagnosed or even if you haven't been diagnosed, you can go talk to them and, you know, maybe it's appropriate for you. Um, they can provide testing services for people who need a little extra time on tests or a lot of extra time on tests or people that don't work well in a noisy environment, they can provide quiet environments for testing. Um, they're really accommodating, really nice people to work with. So even if you, you know, even if you think like, ah, maybe, you know, like, ah, I've always had a little trouble finishing tests on time compared to other people, why don't you just go give them a call or go talk to them and just see if that's, if they have something that could help you. Um, mental health, health and wellness, public safety. They're just all these numbers and things. So uh, that's a good resource. Um, then uh, old lecture notes. Um, I'm going to be doing all my lectures on computer, you know. Uh, 
I'm going to write better than this because my screen's up, but, you know. So I'll be writing this stuff up there. It's going to look a lot better than that. That looks terrible. But, um, and so this, I'm going to write up here just the same way people normally write on a whiteboard. You can take notes off this the same way you would on a whiteboard. But the benefit is uh, after the class is over, I can make a PDF of everything that I've written. So you have access to everything I wrote down during the lectures. And I'm also recording a video of all these, uh, you know, screen strokes. And those will be posted on YouTube. So um, if you ever miss a class, uh, or if you ever want to just go back and take another shot at understanding something I said, it's all going to be available. Yeah. Yes, right. So you'll see the pen. Move. Yeah, it's basically just like watching the whiteboard and, and listening. Yeah. Um, and so that's what old lecture notes are. Um, I have old lecture notes up here because... Um, some people sometimes want to read ahead a little bit or whatever, and obviously, like, I can't post my notes from this semester until I do them. Um, this is my second time teaching this class, so um, these will be, you know, these will be different in probably a bunch of ways from what I talk about this semester, but it's still basically, you know, it's the same topics, same overall approach. Um, here's sort of what it looks like. So just going into a random day from last semester. Um, you know, so it looks like I just started by uh, talking about some old problems that had been assigned and then got back into lecture on radiation. And you can just go to that. And by the way, if you ever miss class, um, you can print out the PDF of the notes from the class that you missed. And then as you watch the video, maybe you could just jot some little notes in the margins or something. You don't have to worry about writing down everything I say. Uh, the notes are already there. You can just make your own little comments uh, beside it. And um, then I have the problems that you're going to do. I wouldn't start printing these out. Yet, um, you know, you're going to have to do all these problems, but I'm going to be adding and adding a bunch of new problems and removing a bunch of problems as we go. Because like I said, this was last time was my first time through and now I have sort of an idea of what what got these ideas across and what I want to change. But you can look through those and see like what types of problems there's going to be. And there are full solutions, uh, solutions that I've done posted for maybe half or two-thirds of them, you know. Um, so some of those, there are no solutions posted, but if you have trouble with them, we can talk about them in office hours or uh, we can do them in front, I can do them in front of the class. Um, but here's what, you know, one set of solutions looks like. Uh, since these are solutions that I've done, um, they, the nice thing is that they follow exactly the set of steps that I go through in class, you know, so you don't have to go back and forth between like how I'm thinking about it and how a textbook is thinking about it or whatever. Um, and then there are some tables. Uh, we're going to use tables a lot in this class, just data tables representing different materials. Um, so these are the ones that are going to come up in the problems. OK, uh, so let's go through the syllabus now. Um, so this is thermodynamics. It's a three-credit class. Uh, by the way, um, what that three credits means to you is, uh, well, there's three hours of lecture during the week. Um, but if you ever Google, like, how much time outside a class you're supposed to st 
spend studying and doing work or whatever in a college class, you know, a list of answers will come up and the answers will come from Harvard and LSU and, you know, some little college in Arkansas or whatever. And all of these very different places will give you the same answer for how much of a time commitment is expected. Uh, they'll say for every hour you spend in class, um, you are expected to spend two to three hours outside of class. Okay, so um, to me in a three credit class, just to make the math easy, that means that uh, if you do a little over two hours outside of class for every hour in class, that's seven hours outside of class. So your total time that you spend on this class for the week is 10 hours, okay? Three hours in class, seven hours outside of class. Um, so that's what I kind of, that's what I'm sort of trying to think of as I give assignments and stuff. For some people, some people probably will need to do less than that. Some people will probably need to do more than that, but that's a good sort of rule of thumb. Um, I think you'll find that if you spend uh, roughly that amount of time on the class, this class will go well for you. you know? um, definitely the majority of times that uh, people bomb out of a class like this, it's because they're not doing close to that amount of work. And I'm sympathetic to that. I mean, I know it's almost never because people are uh, spending their time on Xbox or whatever, like probably everyone in here, most people in here have jobs where they, you know, and there's very different amounts of hours that people are working at their jobs and um, people who are trying to work full time and still go to school almost full time. It's, that's a brutal work schedule. So I know it's, you know, it's, it's not entirely just people being, it's not, I'm not saying that if you don't put that amount of work in, you're being lazy or whatever. I understand it's not that. But the fact is, if you want this class to go well, you're going to need to spend about 10 total hours a week on this class. Um, okay, my name is Guy O'Lakin. I, uh, my background is kind of all over the place. I, um, I majored in math in college. And right after college, I did a master's in biomedical engineering doing like biomechanics muscle and bone forces and uh, velocities and stuff. And then I worked for three years uh, in a hospital lab doing those kind of calculations. And then I moved back home. I'm from Minneapolis. And uh, I moved back home, went back to school at the U and did a PhD in engineering mechanics, which is part of the aerospace engineering department. Um, and engineering mechanics, is mostly about like, uh, well, what I was doing was kind of like um, the deformations associated with with loading in solid materials, you know, and you can use that for all sorts of things. Um, it's a pretty mathy department, it, uh, at least the one I was in. You know, there are ones that are more applied and uh, that are doing work related to what companies are actually doing. Mine was a very like mathy. Uh, sort of traditional department. And so um, my PhD is basically in kind of like one area of like engineering math more than anything, you know, um, like my dissertation has like proofs in it and stuff, you know. Uh, my office is right upstairs, right at the top of the stairs over there, 2302. Um, so that's where if you ever need to get a hold of me outside of office hours, that's where to look for me. As it says down here, I'm doing all my office hours in other places. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. The easiest way to get a hold of me is email. Um, I do have a, well, I have a phone number. I have voicemail, but I don't have a phone in my office. So like, if you're hoping to call me and have me pick up, I don't even have a phone. But if you, if you call and leave a message, I can get back to you. Um, because I get a message that something came in. But email is the quickest way, because I my phone dings and then I, you know. And if I don't do that, uh, if I don't get right back to you, 
Um, so like if you send me an email that asks me a question I need to look something up for or whatever, then it might take a little longer to get back to you. And if it takes too much longer for me to get back to you, then your email goes as the day goes on, and then it's below my main screen, and then I've forgotten about it. So if that happens, then send me another email the next day and tell me I skipped your first email, and then I'll feel bad and get right back to you. Um, so my office hours, um, I'm going to do those in two places. The tutoring center upstairs on the second floor. Uh, I didn't list the room number of the tutoring center, but if you don't know where, where that is, um, it's listed in that uh, that big sheet that I showed you for a second about uh, campus services. Um, so I'm going to do some in the tutoring center and some in the physics mechanics lab. Um, and the reason I'm doing them in those two places is that makes it possible for people to sit down and work on stuff and then come over and ask me for help when, when you get stuck on something or whatever. So if you have the time, uh, if you can just get into the habit for any of these of just every week showing up, working on stuff, coming and talking to me when, when you get stuck, or you know, hopefully there'll be other people in the class there working and you can work together on stuff. Um, I think it would end up being really helpful for everybody. You know, it, uh, Working with other people in the class helps a lot. Um, and it's nice to just, you know, like if you're working alone at home, you get stuck on a problem. You're just, you're just done with that problem until the next day or whatever. But if, if you're working on stuff with other people around, you can get a hint or whatever and keep plugging through. Um, so one hour on Mondays at the tutoring center, then two more hours on Mondays in the physics lab, Tuesdays from 11 to 12 at the tutoring center, and Wednesdays from 5 to 6 in the mechanics lab, the physics lab. Um, and the prerequisites for this class are 1121, that's physics 1, and chem 1061, so that's chemistry 1. Um, Anybody have any questions about office hours or uh, contacting me or anything like that? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, if, uh, if you want to meet outside of those hours, just send me an email and, uh, and we'll set something up. Um, if you really need to talk to me, you know, just come knock on the door, see if I'm around. But... Uh, I would prefer, if it's possible, for you to make an appointment first, because then I sort of know what chunks of time I'm going to have available to get stuff together, do grading or whatever, you know. So if possible, outside of those hours, please contact me beforehand and we'll set something up. Any other questions? Okay, so the materials needed for this class. Um, well, first, what is not needed for this class is a textbook. Um, I don't require textbooks for any of my classes. I think uh, you can get through this class without a textbook just fine. Um, I will say that uh, in the other engineering classes I teach here, the way I teach the class is very different than the textbook. Um, and so having a textbook doesn't even it really doesn't help you in the class at all. You're only getting a textbook for future reference. In this class, uh, my approach follows the textbook pretty closely. Um, I'm sort of, you know, early on in teaching this class. And so having the textbook wouldn't be, you know, it might help you at times during this class. Um, and I think actually uh, you might be able to, it's illegal, you know, but I think you might be able to just Google find a free PDF of the textbook online. So, you know, I didn't uh, recommend that you do that exactly, but um, and if you do buy a textbook, um, you can buy any uh, any edition of it. 
you don't have to buy the most recent edition. They're all pretty much the same. They just move the numberings of the different problems around. Do you have a question? Oh, okay, yeah. And so you can probably save $100 or more by getting an older edition. Um, and then uh, I would recommend, if you haven't started using Shams Outlines yet, Shams Outlines are the greatest, and they have them for every science class that you'll take an engineering class that you'll take from now on. They cost like $15 or $20. They're paperback books with just very brief synopses of whatever, you know, whatever the topic is. And then just lots of problems with answers in the back to all of them and full solutions for a lot of them. Um, so they're just great resources for practicing problems uh, if you want, you know, more looks at the material. Um, both of those, I would say, will probably be most useful um, for future reference. And I think having having a book for future reference is a really good idea. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think you need those for this class. Um, what you do need is a three ringed binder. Um, and this is going to be your main takeaway resource from this class. So, you know, like one of these, you sell them in the, not in the bookstore, like where you get textbooks, but in the upstairs bookstore, whatever they call that, the campus store. Um, and uh, you need some dividers for the binder. And we're going to divide it up into three different sections. Um, the first section is going to have all your course notes. Um, so those can be notes that you've taken from the lecture. That's what it will be for most people and most days. But if you're not there for the class, or even if you just, you'd rather just, you know, some people would rather just listen in class and then print out the PDF later. That's fine too. I just want you to have a complete set of notes. Um, whatever notes are in there, I want them to be legible because uh, this is supposed to be something you can go back to a year from now and refresh your memory on, you know? So if, if it's all just like uh, shorthand scribbled over here and then another thing here, and um, then you need to rewrite those. That's, that's not gonna be helpful to you later on, you know? Uh, and then all the assignments and solutions in the next section. Uh, so, um, I'm going to two times, well, I'll get into this later, but twice during the semester, I'm going to collect all the binders and I'm going to go through it all. And that's going to be the only, my only check on how you've done the assignments and stuff. I'll, I'll talk about that more in more detail, but so, it's, you know, all your assignments have to go in there. And then, uh, after you take the exams and I grade them and give them back, the exams go in the, in the back section. I guess the quiz is also in that same section. So basically, you're going to, at the end of the semester, you're going to have a binder that has all your notes, all the assignments you did, all the tests you did, and it'll be easy to go back and reference those um, when you want to. And then the other uh, material that you need is a graphing calculator. Most people use the TI calculators. That's what I've always used. Um, they're all great. Um, if you happen to be in the market for a new graphing calculator, I would recommend a TI calculator that does eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, that's Inspire and TI-89. Um, if you have a calculator you're happy with, uh, like an 84, 86, uh, there's an 85 too, 84, 85, 86. Um, those don't do eigenvalues and eigenvectors, but that's fine. Uh, you know, you can always um, just on your phone, you can go to uh, Wolfram Alpha and do eigenvalues and eigenvectors there. But um, those don't come up in this class, I don't think, anywhere. Um, but they will, like starting around now, they're going to start coming up in basically every engineering class you take. So it's nice to have the ability to do them right in your pocket. The phones sort of make that easy now. Um, 
Any questions about materials, recommended materials, that kind of stuff? Okay, and then um, I'm not going to talk about the topics to be covered, but that's sort of a list of the things we're going to do in this class. Uh, the grading for this class, um, the cutoffs are going to be, well, unless something goes different than I expect it to go, you know, sometimes I will have to curve it because people's scores are lower than I expected them to be. My, you know, you write a test and to you it seems not too bad, but then everyone takes it and you realize it was harder than you meant to or whatever. So if I have to curve the class to have a reasonable distribution of grades, I will. But most likely the grade cutoffs are going to be around, are going to be 92, 82, 70, 60. Um, and for the people who haven't taken my classes before, you know, you probably have a first reaction that that seems like a pretty, uh, you know, a stricter set of cutoffs than you're used to. Why are they so high? Um, and really, the, the only reason that they're higher than 90, 80, 70, 60, or even something lower than that just has to do with the way I structure the class. You know, that, that seems like a set of numbers that usually give a fairly good distri distribution of grades. I think you'll find, like, if anything, my grades are, you know, higher than, maybe a little higher than uh, the grades in most engineering classes. So it's not like it's going to be really hard to get an A or a B compared to other engineering classes. Um, to get credit for an engineering class, you need to get a C or higher. So you can think of that 70% range as kind of like the passing grade. Uh, the grade for the class is going to be broken down into 70% based on exams, 10% based on the binder evaluations, and 20% on quizzes. So now I'm just going to go through uh, what to expect from each of those categories. Um, so the biggest part of the grade is going to be based on exams. There's going to be five total exams. And each one is worth the exact same amount, 14% each. So there's no, like, it's not like the final is worth 50% or anything, you know. It, um, none of them is really like do or die kind of, but they just sort of add up because there's a bunch of them. Um, and each one of these exams is going to be cumulative up to that point in the class. So uh, you're going to need to keep going back to old problems, old notes. Um, and the assignments that I give are going to be intended to help you do that. Um, so I guess just like briefly, when I, so say we go through, we get, you know, a certain, well, let's say we go through the whole section um, on the first law of thermodynamics. And then after that, there's a bunch of problems I assign. You know, let's say problems one through 11, I assign those. Two weeks after that, we'll be, we'll have moved on to other material, you know, two, two weeks of material will have gone by, and I'm going to assign the evens of those problems again, okay? I know that's sort of unusual, but um, I feel like it works pretty well, so that's what I'm going to do. And the idea is that hopefully this time, without looking at the solutions, you can go back and do those problems two through ten even. Um, and then those also go in your binder. And then two weeks after I've assigned those evens, I'm going to assign the odds. So over a period of four weeks, you're going to do all of these problems twice at the same time that you're starting to do the new topics. You know, And the, the idea of that is that you keep seeing the old stuff, you make it stick better. You know, And I'm going to do the same thing with the assignments are going to say, you know, read the notes from this day. Two weeks after that, I'm going to say, you know, read or skim the notes from that day again while you're doing the new stuff. And so if you just follow the instructions I give, uh, I think it'll be pretty, you'll find it'll be pretty effective at keeping you refreshed on the old material. But all of the exams are going to be cumulative. So, so if that's not enough for you, you, you need to make sure that you know how to do it. <coughs> um, Okay, and then exam five 
they're all cumulative, but exam five is also cumulative. And since it's at the end of the class, that's sort of like a final, you know. And the way that works is if your exam five score, so it counts as exam five, that's what it is. But if your exam five score is higher than any of your first four, it'll also replace the lowest one of those first four. Okay, so if you're if your uh, exams for the semester are 95, 95, 95, uh, 4, and then 95, 92, say, on the final, then you get a 92 for your final exam score. And that 4, that's a 4 is really bad. You don't want that to count. But it won't. Your 92 replaces the 4 also. Okay. So it gives you a little bit of... Uh, room to mess up on one of them. And I think, you know, often the one that people need to get replaced ends up being the first exam because we're sort of getting used to each other or whatever. And, you know, so you get a 70 on the first exam. You think like, oh, that didn't go very, whatever I did to prepare didn't work very well. You come talk to me. We come up with a strategy for the next one that'll work better. Things go better from there. And at the end, your 70 gets replaced with your final score. Um, but this policy is also um, really my only uh, way of doing makeup exams. So, I mean, if you need to miss an exam for something important, come talk to me. Maybe we can work something out. But the idea is if you miss an exam, uh, then I don't give a makeup at that time. It shows up as a zero. It stays a zero all the way until the end of the class. Then you take your final, your exam five, and your exam five score replaces the zero. Okay, that's how it's supposed to work. Um, which means that if you miss an exam, uh, you lose that that mulligan, you know, because you're going to want to replace that zero, you know. Um, and that also means that if you miss two exams, there's nothing in the structure of this class uh, to deal with that. So missing two exams can potentially be a big problem. You know, missing one exam doesn't show up on your grade at all. Uh, missing a second exam is just throwing those points away. Well, like I said, especially in engineering classes, um, if you guys have things going on that you know are coming up, come talk to me and we can probably work something out. But, um, Overall, I want you to be able to make it to these exams. The dates are all given there. So check that against your schedule and make sure that it works okay. And if it doesn't, come talk to me as soon as you can. Any questions about the test? Yeah. Uh, full class. So, um, and, and actually, uh, that's an important point, I think. Um, so, the big bulk of, well, I guess 90% of the grade in this class uh, depends on in-class testing of some kind, you know, the exams and then these quizzes that I'll talk about in a second. And that's a lot. And so sometimes people who have a history of uh, not doing as well on tests as they do on homework or whatever get a little nervous about that. I, and I mean, I'm sympathetic to that. I, but I do think that the way I do the tests is going to um, sort of lessen the stress of you know, like people who have test anxiety or whatever. I don't think you're going to have as much of a problem as in this class with that as you've had in other classes for kind of two reasons. The first one is that um, the problems that I that I put on exams are very similar in thought process and in structure to the ones that I assign in the homework. But you're never going to see like some really off the wall, like where you need to think real creatively about um, uh, about the laws that I that have come up or whatever. It's it's designed to so that if you've done the work that I've assigned and you remember how to do this stuff, um, you should see it and kind of right away just say like, okay, it's going to be something like this. I'm probably going to do this and this and this and. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is uh, this class is an hour 20 long. Um, I always write these exams. Uh, what I'm thinking of when I write these exams is I'm trying to make it an hour long test. So 
I'm thinking I want half of the class to have handed in their test and left within an hour. And so the remaining half of the class still has, you know, 20 or 25 minutes to, to finish. Uh, I don't think anybody in here is going to feel like you're under the gun, like really sweating to try to finish in the allotted time. And I think that's another thing that a lot of test anxiety comes from, you know. So you'll recognize the form of the problems. You'll have plenty of time to work on them. And yeah. Any other questions about the test? OK, so now the binders. Um, so like I said, there are three sections in the binders. The class notes, um, you should have good legible class notes for every class meeting. There shouldn't be any uh, gaps. Um, if you miss a class, like I said, it's easy to fix. Just print out the PDF of the, um, of the class that you missed. But I just want it to be complete because a year from now you might be, you know, see some kind of problem that you need to do and think like, I think we kind of covered material like that in Thermo and I want you to have the notes there and make it easy to find them. Um, and if you like the idea of, um, I guess, mostly when you miss classes, if you uh, print out the PDFs and watch the lecture video and take notes in the margins of, you know, just your own little notes sort of on the notes or on the way that I'm doing things, that's fine with me. Uh, I, you know, I can live with that. That's as long as the, the writing is legible and stuff that I don't have any problem with that as your notes. Uh, and then the second section is assignments and solutions. Um, when I say solutions, so your, um, those are you doing the problems. And when I reassign the problems, I want those reassigned problem solutions in there too. Okay, that's last semester I had some miscommunication with that. So I want, I'm going to want to see for almost every problem in the whole semester, two different times that you've gone through every one of those problems. And I don't care uh, what the format, like how you organize those in there. You can put all of the same assignments together, or you can put all the reassigned problems at the end, or you can just do them in chronological order of when I've assigned them. Any of those three is fine. But I do want to see not just the first time I assigned things worked out, but also the reassigned problems, the ones you've already done. Yep. Yeah. Well, so like if, if the first assignment I give is like 1 through 11, then uh, two weeks later I'll assign 2 through 10 even of those problems. And then two weeks after that I'll assign 1 through 11 odd of those problems. So the total effect is that you do every problem twice spread out over a four-week uh, four period. Okay. Um, okay, here are the two dates for turning in the binders. Um, the first one is October 4th. Hey, that's my, uh, no, that's my wife's birthday, not my anniversary. That's my wife's birthday, though. It's important. Um, <laughs> I'm going to use it like, oh, they turned in their binders. I, I should get a birthday present for my wife. Um. I'm going to give her the best binder. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the second time you'll turn it in is Thursday, December 6th. And um, I'm going to, when you turn those in, getting through those binders is going to be my number one priority. For, and so I think I can get them back to you the next class period. So Tuesday the 9th, I guess that would be. Um, I definitely I'll get them back to you within a week. So because when you don't have your binders, you can't study stuff and whatever. Um, and the, 
So the total, the binders are worth 10% of your grade. I'm just going to break it up into two pieces. So the first time you hand it in is going to be worth 5%. Second time is going to be worth 5%. It adds up to 10. Um, and I'm not going to, so uh, my comments and stuff on your binders, I'm going to put those in, like in D2L, in the grades of D2L. Um, there's a little note section. If you have trouble finding it after I do it, just let me know and I'll tell you where to find it. But that's where I'm going to put the comments. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to write very much or anything in the binder itself. It'll all just be in D2L. Any questions about the binders? Okay, so that's 10% of the grade. And uh, then the last 20% of the grade are the quizzes. Um, and, well, every other Thursday, that's not exactly right. But for the most part, about every two weeks, there's going to be a quiz. And the quizzes are different from the exams. The quizzes are going to just happen in the last 15 minutes of class or so. And the exams are going to be all problem solving. Everything on the exams is going to be similar to the homework assignments that I've given. The quizzes are just going to be short answer questions about stuff that I've said in class. So to get ready for the quizzes, um, you won't be working problems and stuff. You're just going to be reading through the notes. Because I think it's important to try to remember uh, the, the stuff that I emphasize in class as the semester goes on. Um, each quiz is cumulative, just like the exams. So you're going to have to go back and reread old assignments. Um, and like I said, I'm going to put that in. When I give assignments, it's going to give like reading assignments too. And those reading assignments are just reading your old notes. Um, and the way I think about it, um, I sort of think like if you look at the thermodynamics book that this class is sort of based on, it's this gigantic thing. Um, the material that I cover in this class is stretched over like say 200 or 300 pages or something. And normally in a thermodynamics class, uh, you would be over the course of the semester, you'd be asked to read through those two or 300 pages. I'm not asking you to do that, which obviously is a gigantic time saving. But what I'm asking you to fill that time with is I've, I've tried to boil down what I consider to be really important to understand from those 300 pages into the amount of text that fits in your notes for 30 classes or something. Yeah, 30 classes or so, probably a little less than that even. So that's a dramatic decrease in the amount of text that you're responsible for. And the trade-off is I expect you to, you know, what I want is for you to remember that boiled down Cliff Notes version of, of the text better than you would if you were asked to sort of constantly skim all these pages. So that's the way I think about it. And the the quizzes are going to, the quiz questions are going to focus on what I consider to be the main point, you know. So I'm not going to ask for real uh, picky details about it. I'm going to focus on the things that, um, like a lot of times in the notes, I'll write like a star, an asterisk, and say like important, like remember this. And I'm going to focus on big stuff like that. So... To some degree, you're gonna, it's going to be your job to figure out what are the, what are the emphasized points or whatever. But, um, but yeah, you don't have to worry too much about just like really, really picky details. But um, I do expect you to kind of overall remember the flow of what I say in class. Any questions about the quizzes? Yep. Yeah, closed notes. Yep. And the, the exams are closed book also, um, but I'll give you all the equations and stuff you need. Any other questions about quizzes? Okay, and then uh, I don't normally have trouble problems with cheating in, um, in this class, uh, in engineering classes in general. Sometimes I do in my college physics classes, but, um, you know, 
don't copy the work of the people sitting next to you. We have a huge classroom, so I think for exams, I'll probably, and quizzes, I'll just have people spread out. Um, and then additional resources. Uh, if I ever cancel a class um, that, um, that you didn't know about beforehand, I'll put something on D2L always anyways, so that's the easiest way to see. But this is a number you can call. Like if, um, I suppose this is maybe most useful if we have like big snowstorms or something. Um, you can just call that number and find out what's been canceled. Uh, and then here's a little blurb about the OSD office. I mentioned them before, but uh, it's such a great resource. And uh, maybe there was something like that at my college when I went to college, but uh, I didn't really know about it, and um, I've been really impressed working with them here. So uh, if you think they might be able to help you, go talk to them. Any questions about the class overall or the structure of the class? Okay. Okay, so now let's get into thermodynamics. And so here's the first thing I want you to do. Um, I want you to write down Um, first, what do you think thermodynamics is about? It can be as uh, technical or non-technical as you want. Um, if, if you don't have any idea what it is, take a guess. Um, And then uh, tell me what, what was that? Um, tell me what your major is going to be, what area of engineering you're hoping or planning to go into. So what's your engineering discipline? And then the last one is, in your discipline, um, what area or areas can you think of that you would expect use thermodynamics? is, uh, practically speaking, um, deals with conversion between thermal energy and mechanical energy. Um, and in this class, this is going to uh, come up in three different kinds of cycles. Um, the first one is called the power cycle. Uh, the second one is 
the heat pump cycle. And the third one is the refrigeration cycle. And um, all of these, you can think of them as being based on this phenomenon. Um, so think of a piston in a cylinder. Okay, and think of a gas enclosed in here. And think of this being well insulated. Then all of these three cycles are based on uh, this phenomenon. Or I guess I'll do it in sort of two ways. Um, so first, if the load applied to the piston exactly balances the pressure in the gas, so let's say the load pushing down on the piston is balanced by the gas pressure. Then, if you increase the temperature of the gas, Uh, that raises the piston. Um, and the second phenomenon, it's related to that. Um, but starting with that same piston cyl cylinder system, if you push down the piston, so pushing down the piston, raises the temperature of the gas. OK, so uh, this first one, A, is I'm going to that one in red. Um, that is the what the power cycle is based on. So the idea of the power cycle is you um, use a change in temperature of the gas to do work on the surroundings, which is to um, you the work that you do is to turn the wheels of a vehicle or to uh, power a turbine to create electricity or whatever. Those are those are power cycles. This other phenomenon says that if you uh, you start with the piston at a certain height and then you compress the gas, the temperature of the gas in there increases. So in other words, it's kind of the opposite of this effect. This one is you add heat to your system and you get work out of it. B is you add work to your system, you push down on it, and uh, it raises the temperature. And it's a little funny that these are both really the same thing, but the heat pump cycle and the refrigeration cycle are both based on that second idea. Um, so we'll talk about you know those three cycles in a lot of detail. Um, I have a motorhome, 
and uh, the refrigerator in my motorhome is powered by propane. Like, that seems so odd when you think about it, you know, like burning propane somehow powers something that gets cold, you know. But the way it works is that you burn the propane to power um, a compressor it, that does work on the gas inside the refrigeration cycle, inside the refrigerator. And through that sort of two-step process, you use heating up a gas to cool down your refrigerator. You know, and it's all based on this idea. Uh, okay, for, so for number two, uh, the majors that you're probably interested in are mechanical. Civil, um, and aerospace engineering. Is anyone in here thinking about another major outside of those three? Yeah. Chemical, yeah. Anybody, uh, what would be the other? Anybody electrical in here? Okay, so as far as uh, what things that you do in your discipline that would use thermodynamics, um, I'm not going to list all these things out, but the, um, the power cycle is used in any kind of engine. So uh, the heat pump cycle is, is used, you know, you're trying to increase the temperature of a hot region. Uh, the refrigeration cycle is you're trying to decrease the temperature of a cold region, keep making it colder. Uh, mechanical engineers deal with all this stuff. So uh, thermodynamics is, is really a fundamental area of mechanical engineering. But you can imagine like aerospace engineers, they, they deal with engines, they deal with, uh, uh, they deal with heat transfer, um, they deal with fluid mechanics where you have to know a lot about the temperature, what's going on. So in aerospace, it's important. You can imagine civil engineers have to deal with refrigeration and heating systems. And um, civil engineers, a branch of civil engineering is also transportation engineering, where you're dealing with uh, emissions and things like that. So, um, but it all is based on these three sort of fundamental cycles. Anybody have any questions about? Just thermodynamics overall is like an area of study. Um, probably for the mechanical engineers, who I assume are probably at least half of the people in here. Um, so you'll take thermodynamics. And then um, we don't have this the next class here. But when you transfer to, you know, go to your transfer institution, the next class you take in this area is going to be heat transfer, where you're dealing with a lot of differential equations. Uh, that let you calculate how quickly energy is going to transfer through a temperature difference from this side of the wall to this side of the wall or whatever. Um, so all of these cycles are going to, you know, these three fundamental cycles will be approached um, using three fundamental laws of thermodynamics. Um, the first one is conservation of mass. It turns out when you get into um, 
the theory of relativity, conservation of mass isn't really a thing, but uh, for our purposes, it is. Um, the second one is conservation of energy. And conservation of energy is the first law of thermodynamics. Have any of you guys seen The Simpsons where, uh, I don't remember what happens in the episode, but um, Lisa is like isolated at home, so she's just like working on all this crazy stuff, and she makes like a perpetual motion machine, and Homer's like, Lisa, get in here. In this house, we obey the laws of thermodynamics. Um, so perpetual motion machines, or um, the easiest way to think of it is Imagine a machine that you don't add any energy to, uh, and it keeps getting faster, and you know it keeps spinning the thing faster and faster. What's happening there is energy is increasing. The kinetic energy of the thing is increasing without any energy going into the system, and so that disobeys the first law of thermodynamics. And then the third one is that over time, Entropy, and I assume that's something that you haven't talked too much about yet in any of your other classes, but we'll talk about it a lot. Um, entropy can only increase. In some cases, it can stay the same, but um, it can never decrease. And I should say that, that we're talking about the entropy in the universe. Um, universe. Because like in a refrigeration system, for example, the entropy inside your refrigerator that you're trying to cool down is decreasing. But in order to make the entropy decrease inside the body of the refrigerator, you're increasing the entropy outside of that area. And the increase that you're uh, producing to cause the decrease inside is bigger than the decrease you're getting. So even though you're decreasing the entropy inside the refrigerator, the universe, the entropy in the universe is increasing. And this is the second law of thermodynamics. One thing that uh, is kind of interesting about the second law of thermodynamics, well, uh, let me say the relationship between the first and second laws, I don't know if uh, you've ever thought about it this way or had it described this way, but um, in physics one, you dealt with conservation of mechanical energy. And think about the kind of problems you did. There's no way to use conservation of energy to determine which state was the starting point and which state was the ending point. So imagine this, a skier going down the hill, you know? If you specify that the skier starts at the top of the hill and ends at the bottom of the hill, you can figure out what the speed was at the bottom. But using conservation of energy alone, there's no way to say that the skier started at the top versus starting at the bottom, going fast, and moving up to the top. Conservation of energy doesn't know anything about the order that events occur in. Okay. The second law of thermodynamics is going to be our first tool that lets us determine the, well, not the first, but uh, where energy does not allow us to know what the order of events is, we can use the second law of thermodynamics to figure out the order that things happen in. Um, and so that's going to be a big part of why we're using that second law, to figure out not just what are two possible states that satisfy conservation of energy, but which one had to happen later because it has more entropy associated with it. Um, this is like the class of lists. I would notice that as I was like getting ready for this. It's like just list of one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, four after list, but I can't think of a better way. Uh, 
So, we'll use um, these laws of thermodynamics in two types of systems. Um, the first one is closed systems. Um, in a closed system, as you go through the analysis, you're looking at the exact same collection of material, uh, of particles, the whole time. So an example would be um, like studying a baseball as it flies through the air. You're looking at the baseball the whole time. Um, so over the whole interval, you're looking at the same collection of particles. This way of doing it mathematically is always the easiest way. Sometimes that's not a very practical way to think about things. Um, like, for example, say that you're investigating what happens in a air or a uh, air compressor or a water pump. Um, once the air leaves the air compressor, it's pretty hard to keep track of which particles started inside the body of the compressor. What you would rather do is just do your analysis based on looking at the volume inside the compressor. Then you have to take account of how much material is going in and what's it, what its properties are, and how much material is going out and what's it, what its properties are. Um, uh, that kind of approach is called control volume. Control volume approach. And in that case, over the interval, You're looking at the same volume of space as material passes through. And this one, you know, sometimes you need to do it, um, but this one's a little harder mathematically to deal with. So the uh, sort of flow that you're going to see over and over in this class is we're going to introduce one of these laws, we're going to talk about it in terms of closed systems, and then we're going to talk about it in terms of control volumes. And we're going to do that with each one of those three laws. So this one is like, for example, a water pump. Um, and then one thing to keep in mind in this class Uh, we're not going to be doing a lot of vector calculations, and, you know, vectors can be sort of tedious to work with, so that's kind of a good thing. But we are going to have to deal with directionality. Um, so we're not going to have much vectors. Um, 
but the signs of quantities are going to indicate direction. So they do indicate direction. And um, that's going to be like a critical element in just about every problem in this class. If you get, if you think about your signs wrong, you're going to get the problem wrong. Um, an example is in this class, we're going to say that heat added to the system added. is positive and it's indicated with a variable capital Q. So in order to have a, a positive value of the variable Q, heat has to be added to whatever you're isolating as a system. On the other hand, um, work uh, done by the system is positive capital W. Um, and I'll tell you a little more about why they do it that way. Uh, I mean, there's there are reasons for it, but in a way it makes it seem more complicated than it is. In other words, if you're trying to add up the change in energy to your system, the result of this is that the change in energy of your system is equal to the energy added by heat, Q, plus the energy added by work, which is negative W. All it's saying is the total change in energy is the total change in energy from heat and the total change in energy from work. But because of the directions of those, you know, the default positive directions of those quantities, it looks like this. Okay. And so that's something, like every problem you do, you need to be aware that that's a pitfall, you know, especially at the beginning. Later on, it'll sort of get to be more second nature, but um, that's going to be an important thing. Any questions about that? Okay. So uh, next class, we'll start talking about uh, states, properties, processes, and then in not too long, we'll start getting into equations and stuff.